The word is used in the English, but actually there are two or three Greek words that are translated justification. And as usual, I just don't think it quite cuts the mustard. All right. So I want you to make a note of dikayoma. Dikayoma, D-I-K. Um, A-I-O-M-A, and I want you to also write down D-I-K-A-I-O-S-I-S, dikamosis. These are both from the prime dikayosis, which has a meaning, but it has, it's a legal term. You know, we think justification, well, yeah, you're justified. No, it's guaranteed. It's in writing. It's a legal claim, and that puts a lot more teeth into it. And that's what strengthens your faith because it takes it from a word and brings it into reality, into focus for you. So uh, we're going to be in basics, but basics are very important because within the basics, that's what strengthens your faith. And friend, without faith, I'm sorry, you haven't got it. And you're going to have trouble in your life. We're all going to have trouble in our lives, but with faith, it's a shoe in. Hey, bring a moan. With faith, we know before coming out the gate that we're going to nail them, and we're going to nail them good because God is with us. And if God be with you, who can be against you? It doesn't matter because we have the victory. So I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Romans today. We're going to begin in chapter 4 of that book, and we're going to cover a little ground here concerning the promise of God. I want you to bear in mind before we start, we're finishing up Hebrews now, and I never want you to forget that 11th chapter whereby faith is the substance, and that word substance comes from the Greek papyrus, or ultimately, that's how it originally got its name, which was a legal document. That's what you put a legal document on, you seal it. Well, faith is your seal. We talk about sealing people in their forehead. Yes, it's with the truth. But if you don't have any faith, if you don't believe it, you're just pumping air, friend, and that's all. Because faith is the root of how God considers your love. It simply means, and that's just natural. You measure people that love you by their faith in you. If they don't have faith in you, you probably pretty well are sure they don't love me, you know, and so forth. So uh, I want you to think of how important faith is, and it's kind of the foundation of this justification today that we're going to be talking about. And naturally, to be justified is pure, simple, what some people would call salvation, but there's so much more to it, and it's so beautiful. So with a word of wisdom from our Father, Romans chapter 4, and let's pick it up with verse 16 so we lay a little bit of groundwork here. Therefore, we're talking about Abraham here and the promise and Abraham's faith. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace, meaning the free gift, unmerited favor. We don't deserve it, but we get it if you have the faith. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And you all know that the word Abraham in the Hebrew language means father of many nations. Well, I believe the next verse declares that. 17, this is what's important. As it is written, that's important to you. Man can say it all he wants to. But you must see it as it's written, for that's from your father. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. It, translating the, into English the meaning of the name Abraham. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead, that means to make alive the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. In other words, he can call the future exactly how it's going to pass, even though it hasn't come to pass yet. Your father knows what tomorrow's going to be. And he knows what your future is. That is to say, as far as how you're going to be exposed to that future, 
of governments, nations, and so forth. And he prepares you mentally and spiritually whereby you can do that in style. That is to say, his way, his will, and what he would have you do. Um, the fact that he makes alive. In God, there's no dead. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. The main thing you want to remember, God promised this to him. Abraham was an old man, too old to have children by any means. 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall be thy seed be. In other words, through Abraham, through his loins, would come Messiah, naturally. And it would be Messiah himself who would pay the price for our sins, because we all sin. We all fall short. And were it not for the fact that he loves you, he loves you enough that he's going to justify you if, you know, there's a condition to everything in the Father. If you have faith in him, if you believe. If you don't, hey, I'm sorry, again, you're pumping air. That's it. Faith is, the again, the, the foundation of love, all right? Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, I mean, he was strong in faith, Abraham was, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. I mean, when God said it, he believed it. I mean, he was... Here he is, 100 years old, and she was, she was 89, or 90, I should say. It happened when he was 99 and she was 89, be that as it may. The birth came to pass when she was 90 and he was 100. But God always keeps his promise. And that life came forth, which would bring the generation of Messiah. Many people wonder, why do you always talk about the, the generations of Adam and that race of people that came from, because that's where Christ was. And through Christ, then salvation to all that would believe upon him and love his word as it is written. So that's why it's important that you know your heritage, that you know many of you have had a destiny and you've known it. There was more to God's word, even when you were a little child and you were being taught. And it's important that that come forth, that it come to life for you, for the word does live. Now, there's not a one of you that in your lifetime somewhere that you were such a sinner that you felt, I'm as good as dead, meaning I'm not going to make it. I've fallen short. Why would God ever want me? It's for all of us. Why would he want us? And this is the way Abraham was. Well, faith changes that. Faith lets you know you're going to make it. You're a can-do, God-loving, serving person, though you're not perfect. That's what justification is about. Okay? In other words, he had the faith that he didn't let it bother him that he was 100 and she was 99. If God said it, it was going to happen if they were 150 and 140. It would still happen if God said it, if he promised it. That's what faith is, is believing the word of our Father. Verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He believed him, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Always, when God makes you a promise in this word, claim it. If, there's that big word again, you have done your part of the condition. To believe, to know his love. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. I think that's where some people have a hang up with God. Well, he made that promise, but I know he's not going to do it. He probably just isn't able to hear me. Well, you're, again, you're pumping air because your absence of belief and faith will not gain you anything but 
but a broken heart. That's it. Just plain old broken heart. Nothing. Nothing. Will, um, will ever be a blessing for a long period of time for you. You're going to be tested. But hey, being tested is a fantastic thing. Because you can overcome it. You know it. And you prove it to your father and everyone else. That you're a can-do type person. Verse 22. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. This, uh, this word, uh, righteousness, is the prime, comes from the prime, um, uh, dikamos. It comes from the prime of that. Not the word justification. Yep, they come from the same prime. Righteousness for you. Now, it was not written for his sake alone. Now listen carefully. That it was imputed to him. It wasn't written just for his sake. But for us, that means you, also to whom it shall be imputed, if, there's that big word again, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. It's, it's necessary. You've got to believe on our Father. Or you're playing church. You're playing games. He's a reality. He's a power. And he's true. And he always keeps his word. 25. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And it's important that you know what this word justification means. It's the same as justified. It is dikaiosis. Now this is where it's important. It's, the word means in the Greek one thing only. And that's why I want to separate these words for you. The cis with the ma. The cis is acquittal. Now there's a difference. One is simply that it's just, and the other is acquittal. Do you know what the word acquittal means? It means you're forgiven. It means that uh, you're innocent, that your sin is done away with, period. And you're a new person every time you repent. So it is a legal term. It's not a religious word. It is a claim that is... Actual, it is a written right. And that is a legal term in God's word. And God is a legalist when it comes to what he has set aside for you. Because that puts strength in justification that you're free to go. I'm sorry, acquit means exactly that. You, you can forget about your past sins. It's over. It's done with. He doesn't even want to hear about it. Because he knows that we're imperfect. Will we sin again? Of course. Should we try to sin again? Of course not. But to acquit means you have a fresh start. Now, and being a legal term, it has his guarantee. Do you know something? He didn't die but the, our offenses are placed upon him. But he was perfect. And his very resurrection itself brought about that acquittal for you. That's why the resurrection should always be very important to you. There goes your justification. There goes our life. Because in doing so, he imputed guiltlessness to us and upon us. I don't care what you've done. Let's continue right on, okay? Verse chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore being justified, there's the word again, by what? By faith. It's important that you grasp that. You're justified by believing and having faith that our Father keeps His word. If it's written, you can count on it. That'll keep you out of the bar ditch of many a time. If you know and you believe it is written, and it is so. And Father will always see me through. 
He will never leave me, nor will he forsake me, as long as I have that solid faith. But don't play it, faith. There is no such thing. You either have it or you don't. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because of your faith. Two, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Do you think there's any other access? There's only one access and that's Christ. And you're not going through him except you have that faith as it's written. You better learn to believe what's written because that's exactly as it is. It is your faith that opens that door. Three, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. That means as Christians, as doing God's work and for his name, we glory in tribulations. Little trouble, so what? So what? We're plowing through. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. That means endurance. Do you, want to, do you want to learn endurance? You run a half a mile the first day you're exercising and it might nigh on to you think you're going to die. And the next day it's a little easier. The next day you go three quarters and that's endurance. You have to work at endurance. You have to work endurance in your faith as well. That's the point. Tribulation makes you strong. A little bit of trouble you work your way through it and God says, hey, I got me a good one there. I can count on that one for so much. Well, how much? I don't know. How much can you take? How much, can, how much faith can you exercise in him knowing, knowing for a certainty it's a legal term, guaranteed, you're justified. And he will never, he makes a promise in another place, 1 Corinthians 10, he will never put more on you than you can bear and he will always show you a way out. Believe it. It's true. Okay, there we have patience, which is endurance. Four, and patience, that's to say endurance, experience, experience brings character and experience hope. Hope is confidence. Every time it happens, Every time you have a little tribulation and you work your way through it, that builds confidence. It's no different than in a job you might work at that you're a little clumsy or a little awkward at first. But then as you gain experience, your hands just fly and it seems so easy. And your confidence in the fact that you can do it multiplies rapidly. I guess what it really says is the more you work at it, the better you get. So you can see why God dislikes, dislikes lazy people. He just really does. I'm sorry, but do you blame him? If you're counting on somebody and they'll never, and they're a little bit on the lazy side, they won't exercise their patience, experience, or endurance, then where's their hope? Well... That's to say their confidence. They don't have it. Verse 5. And hope, that's confidence, maketh not a shame. It never disappoints. Because the love of God is shed abroad, it floods. The love of God just floods uh, in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. His love is always there to back you up. When it's the roughest... Where do you find that love? In your heart. It's to say, in your mind. If you open your mind to let that love come in. Six. For when we were yet without strength. That's meant when we were weak. Without that faith. Without him. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I mean, they were ungodly. And do you realize he paid the price on the cross for them? Would you? Bunch of misfits, no goods, old sinners. Why should I hang on that cross for a bunch like that? Okay. I mean, that's the way a lot of people would th look at it, all right? He didn't look at it that way. I think I know why. I think I know because when those souls were first created, they were all beautiful children. And he loved them. They were, they were, 
his children and until they went bad, hey, they were a-okay. And he has hope in them as well, okay? And um, he died for the ungodly. Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. I mean, you take a, a man that is super, super, super good. Very few people would lay their life down for him, but they might in trying to protect or shield. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare die. You might for that, but I don't think you would for a crud. There are very few of us that would um, be willing to actually die protecting some no good crud. That's just nature. Pardon me, but that's a fact. It's a reality. Eight, but God commendeth <coughs> his love towards us. That's to say he proved it, proved his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did. No holds barred. He didn't have any doubts. He didn't hold back. Well, I'll do it tomorrow if I get around to it. Let him nail me to that thing. It's high up there and it's going to kill me. I believe I'll put it off. No, he didn't. He wasn't lazy. He stepped right up to the mark. Nine, much more than being now justified. Ooh, there's that word again. Justified by his blood. That means made innocent. By what? By his blood. And my friend, there is no other way you're made innocent. And don't you ever forget it. Made innocent by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Through who? Through Christ. It's just the way it works. We've got a real simple salvation message going here, but what I want you to see is how much more is behind it. How much more depth there is to it. There are a lot of ifs. Now, if, I will just throw in a little stumbling block here that might be a stumbling block to some. What if you worship the wrong Christ? The one that did not die for you, but that's trying to kill you. Where are you then? You see where I'm coming from? Little more to it. Why would Jesus say, as it's written in the great book of Matthew, get out of my sight. I don't know you. And they claim to be Christians, see? So justification in those that love him and believe in him, not the false prophet, not the false Messiah, but him. You want to step right into the wrath? Hey, have a good trip. It's your choice. Worship him and him alone. That's important. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies, that's to say yet sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. In other words, when he rose from that tomb, it gave you life. There would be very few of us that would make it without that event. I don't think, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't because I've got a, I've had a pretty stack, good stack of sins in the past and they might have uh, kept me from making the hurdle, but they're, they're, they don't exist any longer. They just didn't, it, not there. Because when he defeated death, breaking out of that tomb, and resurrecting in eternal life. He gave me life. And he gives you life by that same legal guarantee. It is written and you can claim it. 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom we have now received the atonement. Atonement, at one moment, uh, reconciliation you might call it. But I like to consider it a covering. He covers you. He protects you. At one moment in Him. 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, old Adam stumped his toe, listened to Satan. Are you going to? It's a question. Are you going to? I hope not. Adam did. Look what happened. 
One man, sin, entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. How many? Do you want to know how many would make it? You got it. All men. For that all have sinned. You get some of these goody-goody two-shoes, and probably you look at them, and they're patent leather instead of the real thing. All right? Thirteen. For until the law, sin was in the world. Sin was here before the law was. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. In other words, if the law isn't there, well, it's uh, how do you know it's a sin? Uh, that's a, we could read a lot into that, but let it go for the moment. 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Boy, I mean, just poured even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, they didn't do as bad as he did, who is the figure of him that was to come, which is to say Christ, of course. 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. I mean, look at Christ, one man, what did he bring? Look at Adam, one man, what did he bring? That's the situation. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. In other words, he gave life. One brought death, one brought life. One man. And if you think you as one do not make a difference, how many seed, if you do not plant them, and I'm, I, I don't want to make preachers out of all of you, God forbid, but in relatives and other people, do you know how it spreads? It spreads a long way. You make a difference whether you realize it or not. 16, sharpen up for me. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Now, I want you to make a note of the word justification as it is written here, for it is the word dikayomo, M-A, not S-I-S. It means, it doesn't mean acquittal necessarily, it comes from the prime, but it means God's going to do you right. Because you've got to consider those ifs. Do you understand what I'm saying? You've got to consider the ifs. If you're doing your part. If you are faithing. If you have that faith. If you believe. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned or it ruled by one... Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, and righteousness again comes from that same prime, shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ, or I like to say, because of one, Jesus Christ. Because he's the one that paid it, and that's why he should be so ever special to you. Because he loves you. Verse 18, stay sharp. Therefore, as by the offense of one, you might say Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men, how many? All men unto, there's that word again, the very title of this lecture, Justification of life. Only this time it isn't ma, it's sis. And what does sis mean? Dikama sis? Acquittal. A big difference. English, same two words. Meaning in the Greek, considerably more reassuring. In dekama sis, because it means it is a legal term. It is done. It is written. You're acquitted. Walk into heaven. Walk into that heavenly spirit. Be free. Beware of any man that ever tries to put you in bondage by saying you must do this or you must do that. But there's always 
Though man might tell you there's a lot of don't do's and do's, I will rather tell you there's a lot of ifs. But that's up to you if you want to believe or not. It isn't necessary that you be perfect. We would be in trouble if that were the case. But I don't know anyone that is, quite frankly. I have known a few in my lifetime that thought they were perfect. But they were kind of tough to be around, too. Very, not much fun, all right? Uh, but here, between verse 16 and verse 18, you have the same word, justification, but oh, how different, how much more in depth the meaning thereof in the Greek with dekamasis and dekamai. One means it's going to be done fair, but here in 18, it says it's guaranteed. And did it say you would be acquitted tomorrow? No. The moment you believe upon him and ask, you're acquitted. You're free. Move ahead. Go ahead. Do better if you can. 19, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, that's to say Christ, shall many be made righteous. And here in this word righteous, you have the prime of dikomasis uh, or dikome, uh, of dikome, because it's dikayos. Right, the word righteous is diko, is dikayos which is the prime of both those words. It means innocent. Innocent. And that's what you become. Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. That means to say to be seen as it grows. The law lets you know, but when you start sinning, you can see when it grows. But where sin aboundeth, grace did much more abound. In other words, by that acquittal, the mercy and the unmerited favor we gain, if we believe, is fantastic. It floods the world. 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness, there's that word again, the prime, unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So there you have it. Not that justification is just something you say, I believe he died on the cross. And if I repent, I'm forgiven. No, it's a legal term. It means it's in the document. And you can claim it. For God is the judge, the super judge, the judge of all at the great white throne judgment. Therefore, you walk in in substance with that acquittal, that legal Parchment, spiritually speaking, stay with me. It's in your hand. You can count on it is what I'm saying. It's guaranteed by him. Abraham thought, oh, if, if only. And then he said, Lord, you don't understand. I'm 100 years old. God said, You're it doesn't matter. It's going to happen, Abraham. So I can tell you today. You might say, well, I just I can't quit these habits, but... Well, they're probably piddling the little things a lot of people don't know how to really sin anyway. But be that as it may, you may think it's that way. But uh, they may not be, they're, they're important. And yeah, you shouldn't. But the most important thing is, do you have faith? Do you believe in Him? I mean, we know you're a sinner, because we all are. All have sinned. We all keep trying not to. The important thing is, do you have faith? And you tell me if you do, and if your answer is yes, hey, you can ride with me anytime. You can ride with me anyway, but you may not go as far as some. All right? Faith is important. That's what it's about. But it's stronger than just a word. It's a legal deal. It's an acquittal. The judge... Get this, the judge is the one that said it. And I'm talking about the judge at the great white throne judgment has already said to you before you get there, acquittal. 
And that word justification, that's what I want you to see. It's so, it brings the love and just, it flourishes back toward our Father when we realize how good to us He is by saying even before the judgment, you're free. It's wonderful. Now, do you know something? Paul was a great teacher. He uses that word as it was used in the Septuagint in a way that it really scrambled some scholars. But he really brings that point home, I feel, when you take it in the Greek. But do you realize it's in the New Testament? I mean, it's again in the New Testament in the great book of Revelations that has to do directly with you. Turn with me to the great book of Revelation, chapter 15. The false Christ has already appeared on earth. Many have been deceived by him. But some of you will make a stand. And you're not going to bow to him or be deceived by him. You're going to be a champion of your people. We've come here where it's, it's done, that phrase. The seventh trump has sounded. And we're on our way to reestablishing. All right? The kingdom, 15, verse 1, Revelation. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. In other words, simply a reassurance of it's going to happen exactly as the seven trumps stated. Two, and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. That means purity. God's the consuming fire, and he cleanses it. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, now, now that's who we're talking about, so I want you to grasp that. Them that had gotten the victory over the one world system and the false Christ. That's who we're talking about. And I hope you're in that crowd. I know you are. And over his image and over his mark, you understand it, you know what it is. And over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Only they are standing on it. doesn't say where the others are. We know, though, don't we? Verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses. Now, if you want to know what those that got the victory are singing and saying after it's all said and done, that's it. The song of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 32 gives you every detail of what they were saying that day. Song of Moses, servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, and the, this is the Lamb's word, it's all of it's His song. Saying, Great and marvelous are Thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are Thy ways, Thy King of saints. King of those that stay fast. Now sharpen up for me, verse 4. Who shall not fear Thee, O Lord, and glorify Thy name? For thou art, thou only art holy, and don't ever forget that, only he is holy. We're, I'm sorry, we're not. We're working on it, but we're not holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. This word judgments, I want you to understand it real good, dikoyoma. Same word as justified was in that one justification in that 16th verse in that book of Romans we just covered. Same word. And, and it means innocent. Naturally, if they overcame the beast, they're innocent. By that I mean judgment can go two ways, okay? What's the opposite word of acquitted? Guilty, okay? Well, if they're standing with the victory over the mark of the beast, they're innocent. And that's what the word, the word does mean, innocent. I don't want to take that away from you. But we're talking about winners here, not losers. So there we have that word again, concerning those that understand the chronological order in the appearance of the negative, especially in this generation. It's important. Now, something real special for you. And I'm winding down to a conclusion here. 
And you've heard me use this many times, but I hope it takes on a little more power for you this time. The 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. And um, I think we're going to start with the seventh verse here. Let's start with the sixth. It'll set the stage a little better. And, and understand what's happening here. We're, we're getting ready for the, the consummation of the destruction of the one world system and the false Christ. At the end of this chapter, he's cast into the lake. All right. Verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. That means, a, uh, and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, that's to say, praise ye the Lord. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And he does. That's one thing you never want to doubt. He reigneth. He does today, he will tomorrow, and he will forever. So be on the winning team. Seven, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife, that's to say the elect, all right, if you hath made herself ready. Wife and the bride, mm. eight, and to her was granted, now get this, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is, is it flax, is it silk, is it cotton? The fine linen is the righteousness of saints. What this word is, is um, it's um, dikayoma. It means her innocent and righteous acts. It's the same old word used for justification in the 16th verse of that um, book of Romans that we covered earlier. So you see it has a lot to do with you. A great deal. If you want to be clothed or do you want to stand naked before him, it's up to you. The very material that you wear is... Your righteous acts today weave together the blessings that God will pour out upon you as his wife. So it's a very important word. It's not a word that we can just throw around like, are you saved? Saved by who? What? When? Where? God's word is not complicated, but never leave it hanging. You must be very specific, for there are two of everything. For every negative, there is a positive. And you can, don't you ever think that you're above deception, because you're not. Satan is good at deceiving. He deceived Adam. But he did not deceive Christ. Do you know, I could have gone to one proverb... And it would have said this whole lecture better than I could say in simple two verses. And it's that great proverb that's written to wisdom. Do you all know which one that is? Where wisdom speaks in Proverbs? Just one, tell me. What chapter is it? Eight. Hey, there you go. So we're going to turn there. That was kind of a pop test, if you want to know the truth about it. Mm -hmm. And I want you to think on all the things that I have spoken in this lecture. And I want you to think on these two verses that I'm going to quote. And again, I want to reiterate... This is the chapter in Proverbs where wisdom speaks. If you ever want to get acquainted with or remember this eighth proverb, wisdom will be good to you. Wisdom will really take care of you if you will possess her, if you'll hold her close. I want to go to the 20th verse and read the 20th and the 21st verse, and it will say everything if you will really meditate on it. 
that we've spoken in all those uh, verses. Chapter 8, verse 20, wisdom speaking. I lead in the way of righteousness. There's that same word in uh, Greek Septuagint, all right, or in Hebrew's equivalent. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment. There's that other word, justification, judgment, acquittal. 21, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance. Yeesh, in the Hebrew it means existence, life. And I will feel their treasures. Do you want your treasures filled? Wisdom will do it for you. If, and where does wisdom come from? God. It will lead you, dear one, into the very treasure house of God and make a wedding garment for you that is fit for the very King of kings and Lord of lords. When you just take time occasionally to say, I mean, question yourself. Do I believe? How much do I believe? How sure am I that I believe? Test yourself. And I hope you know that every promise God makes, first comes faith in His Word that His will is what you want in your life. You love Him so much that you don't want necessarily what you want, but what He wants. Because that's the way it's going to happen. And when you mature enough in Christianity that you can realize that one thing, you'll have a lot deeper understanding of God's Word when that, that way you would really understand when it says pray in God's will, you don't want anything that isn't God's will. You just don't. So, acquitted. Written. A written claim, a legal statement. That, um, uh, and that legal claim is yours. Make it. Don't mess around. Make that claim. It is a written right. It is your right. So don't ever take a second seat. Step up and take your seat because you're a child of God and you are acquitted already. So claim that and love it. He paid an awesome price. You know what? He saw you when he did that. He did. For you're his child. He saw you. He wanted you near. He wanted to fix a way that you would have no problem in following. So he did it himself for us so there would be no slip-ups because he knew he would not slip up. And in his perfectness was the price paid that you can claim. It's legal. It's written. Claim it. Father, we thank you for your word, Father. Father, we thank you for this gift, which is this legal document, Father, your word, the acquittal. When we believe in faith and ask that repentance to come upon us, and we ask that as we grow in your word, Father, as we continue in this time and this hour, that you strengthen, for indeed it is a pleasure serving you in Yeshua's precious name. Amen.